This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcasters Orion Samuelson and Max Armstrong and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH and your local Case IH dealer. We turn the page on the calendar. We look ahead to the new year now. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year to you. Welcome to This Week in Agribusiness. I'm here alongside Mr. Mike Pearson to take a look at uh, what's coming down the road for the agriculture industry. So much. Max, Happy New Year to you, by Thank the you way, sir. and to all of our viewers. And yeah, there's mostly the same stuff we were dealing with in 2021. Max is going to carry through into 2022. We've got challenges still with the supply chain. We've got waters of the U.S. concern. We've got all sorts of things that agriculture is going to have to be paying attention to this year. You know, quite often you'll hear people say, well, good riddance, glad it was over. But there were some good things that happened, too, as many producers would acknowledge it wasn't all bad. That's a great point. Yields, as we'll be talking in a little bit, were pretty good for a lot of folks. We'll talk with some of our farm broadcast colleagues over the next few minutes here on This Week in Agribusiness, among them Mike Adams, who for years has been a farm broadcaster. He hosted a program called Adams on Agriculture. Mike has retired, now that we're in the new year, but I asked him to reflect back on what he thought about 2021. Well, I think the supply chain issues certainly dominated things uh, as that evolved and we saw that it wasn't going to be so short term as they had talked about and just, you know, questions going into next year already and into the new season. Will there be plenty of uh, input uh, available? What's the cost of it going to be? Uh, are you going to plant more beans because you may not be able to get your corn acres ready? Those are the kind of questions farmers were dealing with and are dealing with. Uh, so I, I think it, it kind of really brings a lot of uncertainty into the spring of 2022 until we see how all that shakes out. Did land prices, land uses, how land is used, come up on the show from time to time? You know, we see this push to, to have more energy generation from out on the farmland, along with continued rising land prices up into the stratosphere. Yeah, land prices we never thought we would see, right. And that, that's amazing and to watch that story. But the energy, the, the, the wind farms and the solar farms that are popping up on, in the landscape all over, um, I've, I've often said I'm not against those forms of energy, but why do they have to take the best acres out of production? That's my concern. I hope we're never to a point where we're looking back and and say, wow, we shouldn't have taken those acres out of production. I mean, I just think we take food production for granted. You know, we hear about South America expanding acres, bringing more acres into production, and we're taking acres out of production. So I have a concern about that, not about that we're going to some other forms of energy, but where we're placing it. Uh, seems like there ought to be some hilltops and uh, some pasture land that wasn't good for anything else, maybe we could use those for, but I understand they do tests and they want to put them in certain areas. But I, I think that is a concern. I hope we monitor that uh, moving forward. Yeah, I think many of us would like to see the productivity, the crop productivity taken into consideration. Yes. Although we're very cognizant of the uh, private property rights that cannot be ignored. The ability of the landowner to sell that land if he or she wants I to. I agree, and that's their choice. And I think, um, you know, you talk with farmers, it's a difficult choice sometimes for them, but it's a, for them it made sense uh, financially for their operation, for their family. So yeah, I understand that, certainly. A lot of drought this past year. When you looked at that uh, drought monitor map, it was jarring uh, many weeks of the year. When you looked at the productivity, uh, the, the productive areas that were affected by that, did that come up, a lack of rain? Talked a lot about it. It was kind of the haves and have-nots when it came to moisture. And uh, you looked at that western corn belt and how dry it was, and the eastern corn belt was getting the rain. You know, as I talk with farmers, they're very sensitive about issues like drought because even if they're in areas where they're not in drought, they know it could be them next year. So they're very sensitive to that. So I would talk with farmers where uh, they had rain, but they w they wanted to hear what was going on out west because they knew. Uh, and felt for those people very much. And then you go into a winter trying to catch up from a drought, it's pretty hard to do in the winter time. So there'll be a lot of moisture questions going into 2022 season as well. The harvest wasn't without challenges. I mean, there was a good dry stretch, you know, right. for many producers, but there were areas where there was a lot of rain dumped in, some snow. You saw some ruts in the field, didn't you? Saw some ruts in the field. And it was amazing how in one area, farmers were well ahead of the schedule. And not too far away, 
they were sitting and idling and waiting because just the way those fronts moved through and it was so patchy. So it, what looked like at one point it was gonna be a really early harvest for a lot of farmers, all of a sudden kind of dragged on for a while. And uh, I know in central Illinois, for example, we're used to having harvest done by November for sure. And to see farmers still harvesting, still in the fields, working at night well into November, is kind of unusual, kind of like the old days almost. Washington, it had to come up often on your oh. show. What did farmers uh, tell you? What did farm organization leaders share with you about the dramatic shift in Washington? A huge shift when it comes to the various regulatory agencies, the White House, members of Congress. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions, I think a lot of concerns, and in some case frustrations, especially on biofuels. Uh, what are the policies of this administration that, as we've seen with previous administrations, kind of playing fast and loose at times with the RFS, and I know the ethanol and biodiesel industry is feeling they're not sticking to the law on that, still waiting for information in many cases, late, hard to plan for the industry that way. Uh, questions, what are taxes going to be like, what changes might be coming, and I think agriculture is placed in, a, in an interesting situation. Infrastructure improvements that agriculture has pushed for for such a long time were in the infrastructure bill, but when you look at other spending that goes along with it on other programs, does it make the price tag almost too high, and how are you going to pay for that, and what will there be tax changes along the way that will impact them? and maybe offset the advantages of the infrastructure improvement. So I think it's been a year of just uncertainty and not sure what might lie ahead yet. And inflation, I think, is a big concern. Where are we headed with that? A lot of farmers remember what it's like to go through inflationary times and hoping we don't go back to those days. Mike, at the end of 2021, retired, but he'll share some memories over his lengthy career in farm broadcasting. He'll be along to join us once more as we continue here on This Week in Agribusiness. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Max, one of the great things about working in this field is we get the chance as broadcasters to meet a lot of interesting people, don't we? Yeah, including the individuals who run the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mike Adams reflects on those folks who have served in that cabinet position over the years. My first secretary that I covered was Bob Berglund, all the way back in the Carter administration. It was interesting to see each one as they came into office, and some of them grew into the office, and some they were never very comfortable with it. Uh, it was interesting to see how that, that took place. And some you get closer to, you and I have known John Block for a long time, and that was always a special relationship. A farmer in that job. That's Think how unusual, remarkable that right? was. Yeah. Um, you know, the members of Congress, uh, the, the ag committee chairs that you get to talk with and things like that. Farm bill times always stand out in, in putting together a farm bill. The travels, we get the opportunity to go to other countries. And, you know, I remember going with John Block to Rome back in the 80s and got to go to the Vatican and, and meet the Pope. That was a very special thing. And uh, travels like to Cuba, I met Fidel Castro. And, and when you can look back and say, wow, I, I went to the pyramids in Egypt or the Panama Canal, those are special things that you remember, and all because of agriculture. Agriculture opened those doors, and as you know, Max, you can go anywhere around the world, and you get farmers together. They kind of tend in different languages, but they're talking about the same things, you know, weather, crops, prices, government involvement, and, you know, it's a universal language. And when I look back and the, the people I've met and the places I've gone, and I think what a special privilege it's been to, to serve the listeners, and I think it, it's such a relationship that we have with listeners, in your case with viewers as well, because they let you into their homes, they let you into their trucks or their, or their barns, and they, they trust you. And I, it's, I've always taken that responsibility very seriously. And it's, a, it's, a, it's been a special privilege, it's been a good ride, and I've enjoyed it very, very much. You're considered a member of the family in many instances. That's right. And that's, uh, that's a, truly is a special privilege. It's yeah. an honor, isn't it? It, it really is, because they, they, they decide whether they're going to listen or not, and they're going to make their determinations. Are you giving them what they need, and do they trust you? And I, I've always felt I don't try to tell them what to decide or what they ought to do, but present them with as much information as I can so they can make good choices and decisions. Uh, sobering, a lady came up to me in a supermarket one time, and she said, you know, Mr. Armstrong, you and Mr. Samuelson are the only farmers I know. And, of course, <laughs> I laughed about <laughs> yeah. that. Many of my farmer right. friends do, too. But it's, it's sobering to think that a lot of folks got their view of mm -hmm. agriculture 
through the broadcast and the way you uh, relayed that story. Any one interview in your career really stands out as, uh, oh man, that was, that, was, that was amazing, or oh, I, I wouldn't want to go through that again. Well, but maybe because of the situation, the setting, or the individual. Well, we've had both, right? We've, had, we've all done those interviews where the, it seems like they went an hour when they only went two minutes and they were hard to get the information out. And some, you ask one question and the, it's gone. They, go, they go for five or ten minutes. Um, you know, several have stood out. We get the opportunity to talk with a lot of different people. I remember uh, interviewing Jimmy Dean a number of times, and he was so funny and said, you know, and just like I'd known him all my life, I never, you know, I didn't really know him. And I remember that and being on stage one time doing a show with Ed McMahon. I guess I'm dating myself with some, of, the, some of these names, you know. <laughs> but to get those opportunities, you know. But, you know, when I think about, you mentioned the secretaries of agriculture and uh, to watch what they do on a daily basis and, and the process of, of government and agencies like USDA, you have a greater appreciation for what it's like and how tough their jobs are. Mike Adams from a base in West Central Illinois. He has covered agriculture over the years and he's riding off into the sunset of retirement, but I would imagine he'll still be out there on the speaking circuit, maybe heard on some broadcast from time to time as well. His show was Adams on Agriculture, AOA. AOA is continuing. It certainly is. I'm very excited to be stepping in after Mike Adams. The show will continue as AOA, only now it stands instead of Adams on Agriculture, it stands for Agriculture of America, talking about everything that's happening across I would the imagine, 50 states. Yeah, I would imagine you'll be talking about some of the same subjects and about many of the same people. Yes, you know, the industry is fairly constant. We're always fighting these battles and they're fighting these battles in Oklahoma as well. Another place where it was an interesting year had the chance to catch up with Ron Hayes of Radio Oklahoma Network. Interesting year. We uh, had, uh, we're, we're primarily a wheat and cattle country uh, as far as our state is concerned. Uh, our wheat crop really turned out pretty good. Uh, we harvest, of course, in that May-June time period, the hard red winter wheat that we grow. And at the end of the day, uh, the quality was really good. Uh, the yields were uh, at the top end of what we've had the last several years. And uh, all in all, uh, basically for the guys that were able to hold on to the wheat a little bit past harvest, they saw some good prices this year. What's your gut feeling about seedings this fall? Did they boost them? Uh, I think they probably tried to. There was a pretty dry fall, so there was a good open opportunity to plant wheat as long as you're willing to uh, dust it in. And then we did get some rain, so uh, it looks like that uh, we'll have at least as many acres as we seeded a year earlier. And I uh, would think a lot of these guys will be thinking long and hard about maybe uh, minimizing wheat pasture and going for uh, grain yield for 2022. It seems like you're never far away from a drought in your part of the world. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they stand out in your mind. There's a dog yeah. on many of them, it seems. Seems like we uh, simply have uh, about 25, 30% of drought conditions in our state, moderate drought, the, 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 the least amount of drought, uh, pretty um, almost every year. And that's the case as we uh, wrap up the old year, go into the new year. We are looking at, uh, I think, uh, really pretty good conditions though. We're, we're fairly optimistic. I think both the, the uh, wheat crop looks pretty good as far as the winter season is concerned, but also our pastures uh, went into the winter in decent shape. Not great shape, but decent shape. It's uh, surprising how many significant snows you get, uh, especially in the northern part of the state at times. It, it, the pendulum can swing so quickly. Yep, yeah, really. Just uh, one good strong system can change things dramatically. Your cattle folks, how are they doing? Cattle people are really feeling good here as we uh, start the new year. We're really, I think, uh, fortunate that we did not have the severe drought that our neighbors further north, the Montana, the Dakotas and whatnot, they had so many problems there and cow herd liquidation. We did not have that. We had maybe normal liquidation at most. A lot of folks have been able to you know, fully retain their cow herd. Uh, cattle prices made a big, big spike in the fourth quarter So, uh, for our calf trade and for our yearly market. So that, uh, that gave a lot of optimism, potential for profitability here in 2022. How much buzz at these winter meetings is there and will there be on in the weeks ahead about <coughs> cattle marketing and uh, <laughs> things that need to be changed in the minds of the producers? Uh, there's no doubt that uh, that first uh, first quarter, early February, that National Cattlemen Beef Association meeting, a lot of our guys will be going to Houston uh, from, our, from our state and they're going to have a, quite a conversation about where we're going with uh, a mandate or not 
as far as cattle marketing is concerned. Disappointed that the Packers have not stepped up more aggressively as far as uh, their part of the bargain in trying to make sure cash cattle trade uh, happens on a voluntary basis. Have they wanted to see more from Congress? Uh, at this point, it's kind of a mixed bag. We've got, we've got uh, farmers, ranchers that are really wanting uh, Congress to get the job done on mandates. Others are saying we really would prefer to have the government stay out of our business. And so, you know, that, that uh, is a real uh, kind of a shoving match almost a little bit between the two factions. Uh, they've been friendly to this point, but uh, there are some very st uh, strong opinions, I guess you could say. The beef checkoff has its share of detractors. How would you say the support is overall in Oklahoma? What do you sense there? I think it really is very strong. Uh, we've got a, a, a faction that simply does not like how the some of the dollars are spent in certain areas, and they're upset about that. But uh, our, our State Beef Council has done a good job, I think, of educating producers about what's going on, how the dollars are being spent, whether it's promotion uh, domestically or the efforts of the International uh, U.S. Meat Export Federation and everything else that they're doing, and they're very visible. They're, they're, they're seen, I think, as a very positive force uh, on behalf of cattle producers. So about 2022, <laughs> uh, what would you say? Cautiously optimistic among your producers, generally speaking, cautiously. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, there, like everybody else in farm country, we are worried about those input costs and how that's all going to play out here in the new year. But uh, the optimism, you know, farmers and ranchers are an optimistic bunch anyway, and they feel pretty good. I think the cattle folks got a good taste in their mouth in the final days of 2021 with better cattle prices, and that always lends to optimism for the new year. Ron Hayes, highly regarded by the farmers and ranchers and the many consumers who listen to him in Oklahoma. And I think there were still worries about weather in the wheat fields here as we tore the page going into 2022. Dry, warm conditions, did they damage wheat? That's a question. And there's a lot of questions about weather. Stick with us. Later on in the program, Greg Solier will join us. He's going to give us that rest of the winter outlook, so a peek into what to expect, as well as another look at that drought update. So stay with us on This Week in Agribusiness. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Well, we visited with this guy a few weeks ago about the terrible damage from the tornadoes in his state. He travels the entire bluegrass state, Alan Watts. That's right, Alan Watts of Kentucky. And of course, for this conversation, we wanted to keep the focus to what happened last year on the crops and livestock front. And here's what Alan had to say. You know, Max, an interesting year because, you know, our year started off normal. Farmers planted corn, but our corn crop this year in Kentucky was probably a record year. You had farmers that said even the worst crop was probably a record record setting year. Wheat was great, fantastic year for wheat. And normally if corn's good, tobacco is not good. But in this year, unusual this year because tobacco was really good too. It uh, had a great tobacco crop and it's getting a strip now. And then the soybean crop has come out really well this year as well. Uh, they've had a little problem, I think, with some disease late in the soybean crop. but. Um, other than that, it's been a really good year. Farmers, I think, are doing well and maybe still riding some of the CPAP payments they got last year and some of the PPP loans they got as well. But uh, a good year. A lot of farmers would love to buy a new pickup truck at the end of the year, but getting a new pickup truck, <laughs> you know, you can order one. Will you get it by the end of the year? Who knows, right? And equipment challenges, yes. uh, getting, getting yes. new equipment yes. also for the farm. In this new year, uh, what do you see looming out there that uh, your farmers are really going to be concerned about? I think our farmers are pretty optimistic for a good year, but fertilizer prices. Man, the fertilizer prices that farmers have had to pay for their pre-cost inputs this year, this past year, and then you look at uh, what it's going to cost maybe the spring of next year or spring of 2022 for, for fertilizer prices and the input cost really in general, but the fertilizer prices have shot out the roof. and. Many farmers are wondering how do you balance it? How do you balance it on the books? But uh, hopefully, it looks like uh, corn acres are going to be good in Kentucky. Obviously, after a good year last year, will continue to be good. Uh, soybean acres, I think, are doing well. Wheat got planted late, late in 2021, but uh, a lot of wheat farmers out there too. A lot of wheat out in the field, and so double crop soybeans. And then the livestock industry is still looking great in Kentucky. Prices have not been the best, but uh, Kentucky continues to hold strong with livestock as well. I have to note that. It, uh, your home state hosts the big, huge indoor farm show at Louisville yes. every year. A return to normalcy, hopefully, there at the, the Fair and Exposition Center at Louisville. Keep our fingers crossed. In 2021, the National 
the North American was held normally back in November. And so fantastic year, no mask, which I think all the farmers and everybody in agriculture was glad to have that. But the crowds were back for the North American. So if that's a precursor for where the farm machinery show could go for this year, it, it could be a huge crowd on hand in Louisville for sure. Many farmers are looking forward to being in Allen's State there for the Louisville Farm Show. That'll be the uh, middle part of February. February 16th through the 18th, Max. I'm sure there's already a lot of excitement building for that event. You know, there have been a lot of these small indoor farm shows in the wintertime, and I've heard the attendance hasn't been bad. Yeah, a lot of folks trying to get out there and see what's new in agriculture. Well, we wanted to see what was new in Wisconsin in 2021. Caught up with Brian Winnikins from WRDN in Durand, Wisconsin. From a crop standpoint, we actually did really well. Um, we had timely rain, Max. Every time in the summer, it was like, uh-oh, here comes, it's going to get dry. We'd get the million dollar rain, and it was perfect. And then when the fall harvest came, perfect weather for it. Perfect weather, some very good yields. Uh, in a farm field uh, right behind us, I had a chance to dry, ride in the, the combine with uh, the producer, and about 170 on the yield monitor. I actually saw 225 for a little bit on the monitor in a different part of the field. So I, th I think a lot of the farmers are, are very happy with what they had. We had some really uh, nice alfalfa, especially in Buffalo County, um, some alfalfa crops where they, were over, they, had, they didn't know where to put it. So we actually were pretty lucky on that. You're close to the Mississippi River, and it occurs to me not far east from you and not too far west and northwest, it was very dry. It was very dry, and we had, you know, the fires in Minnesota, we had the smoke in for, for a while over the summer. You could see it in downtown Durand, and, uh, but we just were right in the spot where it seemed like we would get that timely rain. Your milk producers, what kind of a year was it for them and how does uh, 2022 shape up? It, it was okay for, for a lot of them. I think there's, uh, they're looking forward. They're ex hoping to see some nice price increases, uh, but there's all, they're also really concerned about the input costs. That's the same issue that, that we're having. Good demand, we saw that even with um, the butter demand during the holiday season, how it went up this year again. Those input costs did prompt some producers to cut back production, did it not? Yes, it did. And, and there's, they're, they're also trying to figure out what they're going to do for 2022, because do you keep the corn soybean rotation? Do you maybe change it up a little bit earlier because of the nitrogen costs, the anhydrous ammonia costs? Luckily, this year with the propane and the, and the harvest, because we had s such a good harvest, we didn't have to use a lot of propane for drying down this year. So they saved a little money there, good. but now they're looking forward to what are they going to do next year? Logistics challenges have touched so many industries, and it, it occurs to me, of course, that the dairy industry is so dependent upon truckers to move. Uh, to those tank trucks have to move the fluid milk, and then, of course, the cheese has to move. And uh, there's a challenge of getting drivers uh, for many trucking companies. Has that shown up with any problems in your area that you're aware of? I don't know of any problems of they're having issues trying to get milk transported or cheese transported, but we do have that issue with the truckers. Uh, really, we also have the issue on the river. Remember, a lot of our corn goes and soybeans go down the river, but we get a lot of inputs coming up the river and so that can be you know with the lock and dam system you never really quite know if there's going to be a bottleneck farther down look what happened with hurricane ida that actually affected us a little bit up in, in the upper midwest we appreciated the visit with brian past president of the farm broadcasters association there's more coming up right here on this special edition this week in agribusiness this week in agribusiness serving america's most essential industry is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. This is our special episode recapping the events of 2021 with our farm broadcaster friends. And Max, I know you had a good conversation with Joe Gill. Joe Gill is a good friend of ours. He's a farm broadcaster in Minnesota. Albany, Minnesota is where he hangs out. He's heard on the radio, Chasm Radio, they call it, K-A-S-M. And you know, Mike, we tend to forget sometimes how major an agriculture state Minnesota is. Yes. A dairy state, producer of corn and soybeans, we asked Joe to fill us in on what his producers thought about the year just completed. Such an interesting year, and it all depends upon where you were. Some folks had outstanding crops. 
They had five crops of solid alfalfa. They had corn standing 13 feet tall. It seemed like 20 feet tall. It just seemed outstanding on the heavy soil. Folks on the light soil, they struggled. Pastures struggled. They got uh, half crop of what they got as far as hay, corn silage. We're in a big dairy area. They had a tough year. They're going to be buying a lot of feed. Did you see a lot of stock going to market because of uh, the dry conditions in, around you, or was that a little farther to the west? More to our west. We actually saw folks in our area buy uh, because our pastures were pretty decent. You get in the Dakotas, that region, that's where I think most of the sell-off took place. Do you think uh, after the experience of this year, those who are in dry conditions will do anything different as they look ahead to 2022? You know, I think the folks who maybe sold extra, they're going to hold on to it. I think you're going to see that happen. We saw hay prices. We saw round bales of very marginal hay for $200 a bale. Hmm. And it was, it was frustrating for folks who, who were running short. So I think some folks might uh, be a little more conservative this year. When you sit out of the local coffee shop, uh, you, you get together with some of these guys out in the shed during the, the holiday season. What, what is everybody talking about? What's on their minds? Uh, uh, I suppose national affairs is a big deal, but what else? As I mentioned, our area, a big dairy area. Um, we have a lot of folks talking milk price. Uh, we're dealing with milk futures, 17, 18, 19 dollars. Some of our smaller dairies, it's still not a, a break even for them. A lot of these federal programs have helped out. Um, on that same side, dairy markets selling cattle. Uh, Springer's a couple years ago, Springer heifers, 22, 2300 dollars, now 1200 or 1300 dollars. Mm -hmm. We've even had farmers who just fatten out their heifers. They got a better fat price than what they did as a Springer heifer. What does the milk price need to be for some of those smaller operators that don't have quite the economies of scale? Seems like that $20 mark is kind of the magical number. I don't know if that's realistic to stay right there, but some of the bigger dairies I've heard, um, they're efficient and they build off that efficiency. You're talking 12, 13, 14, and they can still make a profit. How much culling took place this year because of the expenses for those dairies? I think some folks held on still uh, due to the influx from the west. Some of those cows got culled. I think that played a factor and some folks maybe waited and held on. Well, the uh, matter of policy, farm policy, of course, uh, a lot of people pay attention to that, whether it's Farm Bureau or Farmers Union. Uh, uh, what really is at the top of the list in their concerns, would you say? I think it's, it's on the radar, that farm bill. What, what is that next farm bill going to be like? And we were fortunate in our area, Colin Peterson, very visible, very vocal. And with him not being in the position he was, where do we go? Because I think they felt very fortunate to have him as a voice in D.C. So farm bill, I think, is steady, but it's going to gain some traction in that conversation. What were people... <laughs> thinking for you know regardless of your your politics your your policy leanings to have somebody like that in place who could weigh in on the, the other party uh, from farm interest i i'm surprised there wasn't more support for him especially from outside of that campaign yeah and i think it was one of those scenarios you didn't know what you had till now you don't have it right. so i i think folks the ones who wanted some change and maybe a uh, a new voice or a new face, it gave them a time to reflect and say, hmm, how is this going to work out? Right. Younger operators around you, uh, are they optimistic? Uh, what are you seeing from them, these young farmers? Uh, they're a little bit different breed than the generation ahead of them in a number of ways. Yeah, and they're so more uh, tech savvy than even what I am nowadays in, in what they do with their equipment, their efficiencies. Um, once again, going back to dairy, we have a lot of robotic dairies in our area. Uh, one robot can run 60 plus cows. Gives you a lot of freedom. You got your weekends back. You can have family time again, which is different from, you know what, I didn't miss a milking in 15 years. You don't hear that phrase anymore. Right. So it's a, a different kind of farming, but um, they're using technology to their advantage. Joe Gill, he knows many of those young farmers well there in his part of Minnesota. He's heard on KASM Radio. The FFA Chapter Tribute is sponsored by Nationwide, the number one farm insurer in the country. To register your FFA Chapter, go to NationwideSupportsFFA.com. That's NationwideSupportsFFA.com. Nationwide, we stand for you.
This week we are saluting the FFA and we are turning our focus to Wisconsin. Ben Steyer, the state FFA president, is joining us this week. And Ben, what are you looking forward to in this year to come? Thank you for having me this year. We are so looking forward to all the events that will be happening in Wisconsin. Our state president comes from the team prior, so I was able to serve as a state officer last year in a very virtual setting. So going into this next year, I'm really looking forward to traveling, being able to go to banquets, go to chapter visits and continue to meet members. Kind of a, a fun fact is that state officers in Wisconsin travel about 10,000 miles throughout the year. So I'm really looking forward to putting on more miles and, and seeing what else the state has in store for us throughout the rest of the year. That is great. Getting out there, having those in-person meetings with uh, members and advisors and everybody else in the FFA ecosystem. You know, as, as you think back to your time in FFA, Ben, what was it that got you fired up to join and get active in leadership? I joined FFA my freshman year of high school for a couple different reasons. One of which was that both of my parents and one of my older sisters was involved. So from that, I had kind of a foot in the door. I was able to learn a little bit about FFA and all the opportunities it had. But really what got me involved was our fruit sale, uh, something that's pretty common for FFA chapters in the area is to sell fruit. And my older sister had kind of built up a customer base and I didn't want to lose that coming into FFA. So I joined right away so that I could start selling to the same family members and neighbors in our community. Um, and then my freshman year, I was hooked and obviously have stayed involved since then. Ah, FFA fruit sales, one of my favorite places to get grapefruits. And Ben, you're looking at studying animal science, going to stay active in agriculture, it sounds like. Yes, most definitely. I study animal science at the University of Minnesota. My plan is to eventually return home to my family's farm. I grew up on a dairy farm, so I would like to come back to the farm eventually, but look forward to maybe doing something else after graduation before coming back. Fantastic. We wish you the best of luck. Ben Steyer, Wisconsin State FFA president. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. There were a lot of people talking about drought as we wrapped up 2021. Is that going to be totally in the rearview mirror? Let's find out from our weatherman right now. Greg, what do you think about that? A lot of the U.S. is under some kind of drought or dryness now. Now That's right. With a reemergence or establishment or strengthening of the drought pattern, Max, coming off some of the wind and record-setting warmth into the central and south end of the winter wheat belt. But uh, some 85, almost 90 percent of the western state region here in this category, extreme to exceptional drought we've seen a little improvement in the coastal sections of the Pacific Northwest, but despite some recent storminess, don't think this is going to be changing a whole lot. Here is the ongoing dryness and drought pattern. Still parts of Wisconsin, northern Illinois re-emergence here as well over the southeastern part of the country and still lingering into the northeast of New England, but that is a fur piece of real estate, Max, well, and it's it still in some sense a drought. It's hard to ignore. Will that area shrink a little bit? Don't think so, with the exception in this La Nina setup, uh, again, La Nina cooling of the waters in the Pacific. So we realign the steering currents for an active jet stream pattern, and we've seen some semblance of it already into the Pacific Northwest. We're going to add to snowpack and snow cover. Don't be fooled with the recent spat of warm weather. Winters are coming and into position here through the upper Midwest, Northern Plains, and they'll get uh, some sense of drought improvement with snowpack into the Northeast of New England. One area to keep an eye on for, not only through the Plains and Western states, Max over the southeastern part of the country, the Carolinas, Delta region, southeastern part of the country coming off what was a wet fall season. Some of you guys back in the fall, we're talking about such a cold winter ahead. I even went in pursuit of my long underwear just to make sure I'd be covered in the weeks ahead. Is it still going to be cold, you think? It will be getting cold and is getting colder, but uh, look at this contrast of temperatures from just barbaric cold southern Canadian prairie uh, to warmth that lingers across the southwest parts of the southern plains and southeastern states. You know you folks who watch weather, when you get this compaction of uh, temperature lines, you strengthen the winds up aloft, and there will be a reemergence of uh, storminess into the Pacific Northwest and Big Sky and the Dakotas. Actually, across much of the Corn Belt into the Northeast into New England, here is that storm track. Weather systems drop in. They strengthen off to the east. They go drying out southern Texas, California, and over this part of the country in the southeast, including Georgia. Late winter, still quite cold. Lots of cold and lots of warmth as well 
fall situated, generally speaking, uh, over the southwestern part of the country. Down through Texas, the southeastern section of the country, this trough, this bending strengthens. The cold air is here, and here is the end result for late winter time. We're going to make up for it in a hurry here uh, with stormy weather in the Pacific Northwest, northern and central plains, and a stormy weather picture as well. Lots of snow in the forecast for the Great Lakes and New England. Greg Sodia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. So those of you who are into the isobars and the isotherms and all of the technology of meteorology, we're going to ask him now the so why and the wherefore for the, the forecast yeah. you just shared. We just don't make this stuff up, contrary oh. to, you know. Yeah. You're not going to get this just anywhere, folks. That, that's this right. It's not just another pretty face. I that, you that's know. right. Here, here, here you go. We'll, we'll make this kind of as painless as we can. It's a La Nina setup. So the bottom line, cold Arctic high pressure here uh, with a north-northeast wind flow. Systems run the periphery of the jet stream along this kind of you know, stationary boundary, if you will. Winds come up from the the south, the Gulf, warmth in this fashion. And so you get this convergence zone while there is a continuation of warmth and probably heat as well early in the season over this part of the country. Promises to be active and moisture laden in this corridor, whether it's cold or moisture, looks to be centered on the Corn Belt. Well, I'm thinking about snowstorms. Obviously, that's the first thing you think about in winter, but could there be wintertime tornadic activity in this kind of division? Yeah, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't know when the season really ends or starts or kind of we get into these out of season severe weather outbreaks. And this would be another setup uh, getting into early springtime, ramping it up again. Here's the lingering cold warmth here in this part of the country. It is a quick and fast 150, almost 200 mile an hour jet stream at times. That's a lot of lift and you lift the air and you condense out late season snows for the southern Canadian prairie. We should see drought improvement here. A stormy weather picture for the Great Lakes region into the northeast of New England. Normalized precip over the drought areas of the southeast, but this is a problem. Central and south wind or wheat belt and into central and southern California as well, despite recent storm activity there. Let's go into mid spring. What time frame are you talking about specifically? Uh, if you were to take a look at, uh, let's say anywhere from uh, mid to April to maybe mid May in that uh, setting. So we're kind of getting ramped up across the uh, central latitudes with planting. Here's a lingering pocket of cold warmth here and here. The jet stream continues its northward migration in a weakening La Nina setup, by the way. But we still manufacture moisture. It's about normal Pacific Northwest. It's not normal. It's drying through California, the southwest, down through Texas. It is a stormy and wet weather pattern as we get into much of the northern through central and eastern Corn Belt locales into the northeast of New England. We're okay with soil moisture from the Missouri back westward. Seems like more of those springs are wet. Well, what do we see late spring then? What do you what do you think about that? The, the, the warmth is building in there. Soils are warming. A little pocket of cold. Not a lot of cold. Again, La Nina is winding out. Look at the warmth expanding, as you would expect for the time of year. Uh, kind of a shrinking of the wet weather pattern into the Pacific Northwest. Problems here. More dryness and drought here. This is the problem. Northern and eastern corn belt in the northeast in New England. Looks to be a wet planting season for many areas of the heartland, especially through the Midwest corn and bean complex. Well, we're pleased to have the Secretary of Agriculture join us here on our January 1st edition of This Week in Agribusiness, starting off a new year. Secretary Tom Filsack, thank you for your availability, and uh, we appreciate you sharing a little bit of insight with us here. The thing that comes to mind is just how crowded that radar screen is for many of our folks out on farms and ranches right now. There are a lot of concerns, and logistics, it seems, relate to, to many of those. Oh, that's true, Max. And, and I think we have to look at the supply chain challenge that uh, farmers face and understand that there are some things we can control and some things we can't. Obviously, this supply chain uh, situation is a result of strong demand, which is obviously a good thing. So what we're trying to focus on at USDA is trying to figure out how we can help on the revenue side, how we can maintain income for farmers, increase income, expand income, so they have the capacity to deal with some of the challenges that they currently face with high price uh, of inputs. Uh, looking at, at continuing a record year in exports. We had a record year in 2021. We expect a record year of exports in 2022. Continuing to figure out ways in which we can create more new and better markets with additional processing capacity. You're gonna see a lot of that activity in 2022. Uh, support, continue support for, uh, for the industry as we did in 2021. You're gonna see a lot of interesting uh, opportunities for us to provide additional resources. So 
uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're really focused on, on markets and on revenue. Uh, and then hopefully uh, the supply chain will unclog itself over time. We'll get back into a more stable circumstance and farmers will see some of those input costs coming down. It sure is a huge concern for the season ahead, not just the cost of the inputs, as you know, Mr. Secretary, but the availability of them. Is there anything that you or the White House can do to work with the Chinese since we, we've become so dependent upon them for the inputs for our crops, it seems? Well, I, I think what we can do is to try to focus on uh, on freeing up some of the uh, of the uh, situation in the ports. You see the extended hours in the ports. You see that we are making a request uh, for the Oakland port to basically be more open to agricultural products and be able to uh, move products in and, and through that uh, port more effectively. We're looking at ways in which we can increase truck drivers to get uh, uh, resources that may be sitting on a dock uh, back into the economy. So there are things we can do. You know, we continually talk uh, to to uh, to the Chinese, but the reality is that they are essentially not exporting because they are using it for their own farmers. And it's pretty difficult, obviously, for them. So we're constantly looking for creative ways to work, if you will, work around uh, the situation that we confront. Could these input problems, though, ultimately affect the yield of our crops going into this 2022 season? And is that a concern of anybody at USDA? Well, obviously, we're always concerned about yields. We're concerned about price. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we are also concerned about Mother Nature. Uh, we've obviously seen a significant number of, of disasters occur in 2021 that impact and affect yields, whether it's a drought or whether it's horrific storms or uh, a tornado that nobody could anticipate occurring in a winter storm in December. Uh, so obviously, we're concerned about that. That's one of the reasons why we continue to look for ways to provide risk management. Uh, for producers. We look for uh, an opportunity to utilize some of the programs that Congress has put together to provide additional relief. The WIP Plus program, where Congress has associated an additional $10 billion for losses in 2021. Uh, we obviously will continue to look for ways in which we can uh, supplement and amplify uh, the, the risk management tools and the support tools that we have. And at the end of the day, you know, we've got the, the Farm Bill programs that also provide help and assistance. So a broad range of opportunities uh, and at the same time, looking for ways in which we can expand markets. I'm really excited about the Climate Smart Agriculture uh, uh, and Forestry Partnership Initiative. That's going to create opportunities, Max, for farmers to be paid uh, to embrace climate smart agriculture practices, which over time could help increase productivity uh, and enhance soil health and, and improve water quality. So all of that, I think, is uh, it looks to me as a, as a really exciting and uh, opportunistic year for 2022. On these supply chain issues, we know that the trucking industry is a big part of what we do in agriculture. Uh, that is a, also a, a key piece of this puzzle, is it not? And uh, that shortage of drivers is not going to be easily overcome, is it? Uh, well, again, we're, we're making an effort. We're also looking at ways at, U, at USDA to use some of the resources we have to maybe incent or encourage folks who may have left that job to come back for at least for a period of time to, to move agricultural products. So I think there are a variety of ways in which we can make a difference uh, over the long term. Looking at biofuels, farmers are always concerned about where the biofuels, the renewable fuels policy is going to go, where it is, what will happen to it. How optimistic are you about the future of biofuels for agriculture, especially when you hear about things like the airline industry is starting to, to use biofuels? Well, I'm very optimistic about this. I was at, uh, in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio at the GE uh, aviation plant where they make jet engines and they are basically banking the, their the future jet engine on the ability to have a sustainable aviation fuel that is uh, bio-based. Uh, I think this is a potential 35, 36 billion gallon market. Uh, I think there is a significant amount of uh, interest in the Department of Energy and Department of Transportation and USDA working collaboratively to help uh, develop this industry. At the same time, I think we're, uh, we see a growth pattern for uh, the renewable fuel standard as well for cars and trucks. So we see a, a very solid number for 2022. Uh, we obviously have provided additional resources and help for the biofuel industry. Um, and we're looking for ways in which we can expand access to higher blends. That's uh, the reason we announced a $100 million infrastructure a fund that helps to, to fund uh, these distribution systems, these pumping systems that will allow E15 and higher blends to be more readily available. So I think that the, uh, the arrow is uh, pointing up in terms of the biofuel industry for 2022. Secretary Vilsack, Happy New Year to you, and thank you for spending time with us. Likewise, Mac.
Well, there's always that feeling of starting anew, starting fresh, and I guess that's the way we are in agriculture. You know, you always talk about farmers, Mike, being the eternal optimists, and they really are. They, you, you couldn't be in the business of farming and ranching if you weren't an optimist. No, I think that's a really great point. Just the amount of risk and hope you have when you start each season with that seed in the ground lends itself to being optimistic. And the technological advances that help farmers and the enthusiasm and the business mindset that many of our producers have, now, they're family farmers. Let me underscore that. It's one of the most misunderstood <laughs> yeah. and most popular misconceptions that corporate agriculture has taken over all of agriculture. But as you know, most of these are family farms that have incorporated for tax purposes. That's right. Something like 98% of all farms in this country are family owned. And just like you said, they've adopted technology. They've figured out better ways to manage their business through this crazy pandemic. I think agriculture looks good heading into 2022, Max. Well, we look forward to covering it with you, sir. We look forward to your joining us here for this week in agribusiness. We'll see you next week and the week after and the week after. So long, everyone. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.